Hi everyone, today we're going to read a short story called The Right Kind of House. The automobile that stopped in front of Aaron Hacker's real estate office had a New York license plate. Aaron didn't need to see the license plate to know that its owner was new to the elm-shaded town of Ivy Corners. The car was a red convertible. There was nothing else like it in town. The man got out of the car and headed straight for the door. It seems to be a customer, said Mr. Hacker to the young lady at the other desk. Let's look busy. It was a customer, all right. The man had a folded newspaper in his right hand. He was a bit on the heavy side and wore a light gray suit. He was about 50 with dark curly hair. The skin of his face was flushed and hot, but his narrow eyes were frosty clear. He came through the doorway and nodded at Aaron. Are you Mr. Hacker? Yes, sir, Aaron smiled. What can I do for you? The man waved the newspaper. I saw the name of your agency in the real estate section of the newspaper. Yep, I take an ad every week. Lots of city people are interested in a town like ours, Mr. Waterbury, the man said. He pulled a white handkerchief out of his pocket and mopped his face. Hot today. Unusually hot, Aaron answered. Doesn't often get so hot in our town. We're near the lake, you know. Well, won't you sit down, Mr. Waterbury? Thank you. The man took a chair and sighed. I've been driving around. Thought I'd look at the town over before I came here. Very nice little place. Yes, we like it, said Aaron. Now, I really don't have much time, Mr. Hacker. Suppose we get right down to business. Suits me, Mr. Waterbury. Well then, was there any place in particular you were interested in? As a matter of fact, yes. I saw a house at the edge of town across the way from an old deserted building. Was it an old yellow house with pillars? asked Aaron. Yes, that's the place. I thought I saw a for sale sign, but I wasn't sure. Do you have that house listed? Aaron chuckled softly. Yeah, we got it listed, all right. He flipped through the leaf, loose leaf book and pointed to a typewritten sheet. But you won't be interested for long. Why not? Aaron turned the book around. Read it for yourself. Authentic colonial, eight rooms, two baths, large porches, trees, and shrubbery, near shopping and schools, $75,000. Still interested? The man stirred uncomfortably. Why not? Something wrong with it? Well, Aaron scratched his temple. If you really like this town, Mr. Waterbury, I mean, if you really want to settle here, I have any number of places that would suit you better. So, nowadays, $75,000 for a house would be very cheap. But this story took place, and if we go back up, around 1960s, 1970s. So, that was a lot of money for a house back then. All right. Now, just a minute, the man looked indignant. I'm asking you about this colonial house. Do you want to sell it or not? Do I? Aaron chuckled. Mister, I've had that property on my hands for five years. There's no house I'd rather collect commission on. Only my luck ain't that good. What do you mean? I mean, you won't buy it. That's what I mean. I keep the listing on my books just for the sake of old Sadie Grimes. Otherwise, I wouldn't waste the space, believe me. I don't get you. Then let me explain. Mrs. Grimes put her place up for sale five years ago when her son died. She gave me the job of selling it. I didn't want the job, no sir. I told her that to her face. I mean, that place ain't even worth $10,000. The man swallowed. Ten? And she wants $75,000? That's right. It's a real old house. I mean old. Some of the beams will be going in the next couple of years. The basement is full of water half the time. The upper floor is leaned to the right about nine inches and the grounds are a mess. Then why does she ask so much? Aaron shrugged. Don't ask me. Sentiment, maybe. The house has been in her family since the revolution or something like that. The man looked at the floor. That's too bad, he said. Too bad. He looked up at Aaron and smiled sheepishly. I kind of like that place. It was, I don't know how to explain it, the right kind of house. I know what you mean. It's a friendly old place. 
A good buy at $10,000, but $75,000? He laughed. I think I know Sadie's reasoning, though. You see, she doesn't have much money. Her son was supporting her. He was doing well in the city. Then he dies, and she knew that it was sensible to sell. But she couldn't bring herself to part with the old place. So she set a price tag so high that nobody would buy it. That eased her conscience. Mr. Hacker shook his head sadly. It's a strange world, ain't it? Yes, Mr. Waterbury said thoughtfully. Then he stood up. Tell you what, Mr. Hacker, suppose I drive out to see Mrs. Grimes. Suppose I talk to her about it and get her to change her price. You're fooling yourself, Waterbury. I've been trying for five years. Who knows? Maybe if someone else tried. Aaron Hacker shrugged his shoulders. Who knows is right. It's a strange world, Mr. Waterbury. If you're willing to go to the trouble, I'll be only too happy to lend a hand. Good, then I'll leave now. Fine, you just let me ring Sadie Grimes and I'll tell her you're on your way. Waterbury drove slowly through the quiet streets. The trees that lined the avenues cast peaceful shadows on the hood of the car. He reached the home of Sadie Grimes without once passing another moving vehicle. He parked his car beside the rotted picket fence that faced the house. The lawn was a jungle of weeds and crabgrass, and the columns that rose from the front porch were covered with flaking paint. There was a hand knocker on the door. He banged it twice. The woman who came to the door was short and plump. Her hair was white and her face was lined. She wore a heavy wool sweater despite the heat. You must be Mr. Waterbury, she said. Aaron Hacker said you were coming. Yes, the man smiled. How do you do, Mrs. Grimes? It's awfully hot out here, he chuckled. Hmm, well, come in then. I've put some lemonade in the ice box. Only, don't expect me to bargain with you, Mr. Waterbury. I'm not that kind of person. Of course not, the man said, and followed her inside. They entered a square parlor with heavy furniture. The only color in the room were the faded hues of the worn rug in the center of the floor. The old woman headed straight for her rocker and sat motionless, her wrinkled hands folded sternly. Well, she said, if you have anything to say, Mr. Waterbury, I suggest you say it. The man cleared his throat. Mrs. Grimes, I've just spoken with your real estate agent. I know all that, she snapped. Aaron's a fool. All the more for letting you come here with the notion of changing my mind. I'm too old for changing my mind, Mr. Waterbury. Uh, well... I don't know if that was my intention, Mrs. Grimes. I thought we would just talk a little. She leaned back and rocked, and the rocker squeaked. Talk's free. Say what you like. Yes, he mopped his face again and shoved the handkerchief back into his pocket. Well, let me put it this way, Mrs. Grimes. I'm a businessman, a bachelor, never married, and I live alone. I've worked for a long time, and I've made a fair amount of money. Now I'm ready to retire, to somewhere quiet, I like Ivy Corners. I passed through here some years ago on my way to Albany. I thought one day I might like to settle here. So? So, when I drove through your town today and saw this house, it just seemed right for me. I like it too, Mr. Waterbury. That's why I'm asking a fair price for it. Mr. Waterbury blinked. A fair price? You'll have to admit, Mrs. Grimes, that these days a house like this shouldn't cost more than... That's enough, the woman cried. I told you, Mr. Waterbury, I don't want to sit here all day and argue with you. If you won't pay my price, then we can forget all about it. But, Mrs. Grimes, good day, Mr. Waterbury. She stood up, indicating that he should leave. But he didn't. Wait a minute, Mrs. Grimes, he said. Just a moment. I know it's crazy, but all right, I'll pay what you want. She looked at him for a long moment. Are you sure, Mr. Waterbury? Positive. I have enough money. If that's the only way you'll have it, then that's the way it'll be. She smiled. I think that lemonade will be cold enough now. I'll bring you some, and then I'll tell you something about this house. He was mopping his brow when she returned with the tray. He gulped at the frosty yellow beverage greedily. This house, she said, easing back into her rocker, has been in my family since 1802. It was built 15 years before that. Every member of the family, except for my son Michael, was born in the upstairs bedroom. 
I know it's not the most solid house in Ivy Corner. After Michael was born, there was a flood in the basement, and we never seemed to get it dry. I loved the old place, though. You understand. Of course, Mr. Waterbury said. Michael's father died when Michael was nine. There were hard times then. I did some needlework, and my own father left me some money which supports me today. Not in a very grand style, but I manage. Michael missed his father, perhaps even more than I. He grew up to be, well, wild is the only word that comes to mind. The man nodded with understanding. When he graduated from high school, Michael left Ivy Corners and went into the city. He went there against my wishes, make no mistake, but he was like so many young men, full of ambition, wild ambition. I didn't know what he did in the city, but he must have been successful. He sent me money regularly. However, I didn't see him for nine years. Ah, the man sighed sadly. Yes, it wasn't easy for me, but it was even worse when Michael came home, because when he did, he was in trouble. Oh? Oh? I didn't know how bad the trouble was. He showed up in the middle of the night looking thinner and older than I could have believed possible. He had no luggage with him, only a small black suitcase. When I tried to take it from him, he almost struck me. Struck me, his own mother. I put him to bed myself as if he was a little boy again. I could hear him crying out during the night. The next day, he told me to leave the house just for a few hours. He wanted to do something, he said, but he didn't explain what. But when I returned later that evening, I noticed that the little black suitcase was gone. The man's eyes widened over the lemonade glass. What did it mean, he asked. I didn't know then, but I found out soon, too terrible soon. That night, a man came to our house. I don't even know how he got in. I first knew when I heard the voices in Michael's room. I went to the door and tried to listen. I tried to find out what sort of trouble my boy was in. But I heard only shouts and threats. And then she paused and her shoulders sagged. And a shot, she continued. A gunshot. When I went into the room, I found the bedroom window open and the stranger was gone. And Michael, he was on the floor. He was dead. The chair creaked. That was five years ago, she said. Five long years. It was a while before I realized what had happened. The police told me the story. Michael and this other man had been involved in a crime, a serious crime. They had stolen money, many, many thousands of dollars. Michael had taken that money and run off with it. He wanted to keep it all for himself. He hid it somewhere in this house. To this very day, I don't know where. The other man had come looking for my son, looking to collect his share. When he found the money was gone, he, he killed my boy. She looked up. That's when I put this house up for sale at $75,000. I knew that someday my son's killer would return to look for the money. Some day he would want this house at any price. All I had to do was wait until I found a man willing to pay too much for an old lady's house. She rocked gently in the chair. Waterbury put down the empty glass and licked his lips. He was having trouble keeping his eyes open, and his head was growing very, very dizzy. Ugh, he said, this lemonade is bitter. So we'll stop there for today. Go ahead and answer the reading questions that go along with this story.